and welcome to Gardening with Native Plants program with Darren Davidson from the COSU Extension. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jess Rainey. I'm with the Boulder Public Library. This online program will be recorded and it is an extension of library services. Therefore, all conduct and library policies apply in this online space. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. And I'm gonna pass this off to Darren and where I'm so excited to learn from Darren, I've read so many things that you have, have written and I've seen your landscape designs and various native plant publications. Um, so I'm super, super thrilled to, to learn from you and I will I'll pass it off. Great, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. As you said, my name is Darren Davidson. I'm the CSU Horticulture Extension Agent for Boulder County. Um, and native plants is one of my um, passions, one of my areas of expertise uh, in horticulture. And I'm excited to chat with you about them. Um, just briefly want to touch on what extension is for those who might not be familiar with that. Um, so we are the branch of the university, the CSU, the, the other university, um, that extends research-based information into the community. And so we have lots of different programs within the office, um, including horticulture where I am. And we have a program called the Native Plant Master Program. So for people who might be more interested in um, native plants, you can check that out. Uh, it's a, it's a field-based sort of botany class um, where you can delve into more native plants and botany and uses of native plants and those sorts of things. So just wanted, since if you're here, you're interested in native plants. So I wanted to give a little bit of information around that. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to dive in. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to talk about what is a native plant and why should we use them in our landscapes. We're going to talk about our eco region and what makes this area unique. We're gonna talk about some design tips, native plant combinations, and then I'm gonna go through an actual sample design and it's um, one that Jess may have been referring to to just sort of walk you through how that was created to maybe give you some ideas of how you can incorporate native plants into your design. Then we're gonna talk about finishing touches like mulch and things like that. Um, and then there should be some time for Q&A. Um, and throughout the presentation, I, I do have photos of native plants that do well in the landscape um, with the, the name below. So if you see anything you like and you wanna check out, um, those will be throughout. So um, first of all, why native plants? Why is this important? So for one thing, when you're gardening with native plants and using native plants, you're working with nature and for nature, and you're using fewer resources. So for instance, um, in the um, Western US, it's estimated that about 60% of municipal fresh water is used on the landscape. And so that's water that could be, um, you know, you can use for drinking and bathing and cooking and washing and those sorts of things. And we're dumping it outside on the landscape. So native plants, generally speaking, use less water. So that's a really key thing. Um, they still need some water because most things do, but you can design your landscape to use less of that potable water. And then another big thing is that they, native plants promote and provide pollinator habitat. So pollinators, um, one of the biggest, biggest threats that pollinators face right now is habitat loss. And so this is definitely a case of if you build it, they will come. Um, again, incorporating those native plants, you're going to support not only specialists. So there are some insects, pollinators, particularly bees that are specialists, and they really only pollinate and work um, uh, plants in a specific family. And so if you provide those plants for them, they're going to have more resources that they need. Um, you're also going to support more diversity in those pollinators and, and in your habitat. Um, the Xerces Society, um, which is a, a research institute that studies and is all about the conservation of invertebrates, um, did a study that showed that um, native plants are four times more attractive to native bees than exotic flowers. So um, lots of pollinators will still visit non-native plants, 
but they do tend to be more attracted to the native plants because they co-evolved with them. You know, if these plants were here and the, the pollinators were here, they, they sort of go hand in hand. Um, and then also native plants tend to have fewer pests and diseases and therefore fewer inputs. Um, they're, you know, we don't have to be fertilizing. We don't, they don't have um, weird diseases because they're not from this, our eco region. So native plants just tend to be a little more um, resilient. Uh, I love this little comic. I, I use it a lot. Um, you see on the left, the dad's doing sort of the, you know, we've got the lawn, so we've got our mower out and we're just doing the thing. And then the, the little kids saying, hey, I think we need to have a talk about the bees and the flowers. So um, one thing that's important to know about is ecoregions. Um, so we live in particular ecoregion um, and that is an area, uh, landscapes are part of a larger ecoregion and they denote um, areas with general similarities. So that is soil type, climate type, so precipitation amounts and the types of plants that grow in these spaces. And so that's really important to know, especially when you're thinking about native plants. So the image on the um, left, um, I don't know if you can see the, the tiny little text, but it says level three ecoregions of Colorado. Um, and that's broken into um, six different ecoregions. So pretty broad, pretty big. So you've got Southern Rockies in the middle, um, over on the right, you've got the high plains and so on. And those are pretty broad. If you look at the image on the right, that's level four ecoregions. And so that's sort of drilling down even more. And then you can see lots of different smaller ecoregions. Um, you know, we have things called salt desert shrub basins, alpine zone, sedimentary subalpine forests. So that's getting really, really specific with the, these um, generalities. But for our purposes and for when we're talking about gardening with native plants, we can generally be looking and thinking about it at the, the um, bigger scale in that um, image on the right. So where we are, we're really talking about um, the front range and maybe the foothills. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that's defined, the front range is defined as east of the continental divide and west of the prairie and plains. And then north to south, we're looking at the, about the Wyoming border to down around Colorado Springs. So within that, um, that general area, we get all these different habitats. You have forests and rocky hillsides, riverbeds, wetlands, you even get short grass prairie. So lots of different vegetative communities are possible. So when we think about a native plant, you know, obviously, um, we have to understand that state borders are political borders. They're not ecological borders. And so we have plants that might be native in Colorado, but they're also going to go up into Wyoming and east into Nebraska. And, they, you know, they don't pay attention to those state borders. But you can see that within just within the front range, we're going to have all of these different um, plants and all of these communities possible. So one thing that also is very, um, that really defines the front range and that is very important to think about when you're talking about plants, what plants do well here, is our proximity to the Rocky Mountains. So those create a really complex climate. Um, we can have all of these extreme things. So we can have high winds. I think the state record for winds was up um, near Long's Peak and it was over 200 miles an hour. We can have localized really heavy rains, tons of snow, no snow, periods of drought, you know, extreme temperatures. So the point is, it's pretty hard to be a plant here. It's pretty hard to be um, a happy plant along the front range. We bring in plants, um, exotic plants that are, you know, maybe they're somewhat adapted to our area as far as um, the temperatures, you know, like or zones, if you've heard of hardiness zones, but we have to do a lot of things to make them happy. We have to amend the soil, we have to fertilize, we have to give extra water, all of these things. So again, if we can find native plants that do well in um, the, the eco region that they're already comfortable in, 
then we have to generally do less. Um, another thing that we get from the Rockies is a range of soils. So we either get well-drained soils or um, that are rocky or really sticky clay, both of which have their own issues. Uh, so to amend soil for natives, um, oftentimes you don't have to do much, which is pretty great. Um, if you're in a fairly new development and everything has been scraped and maybe just some, um, you know, they call it topsoil has been brought back in, that's not necessarily going to be native soil. So you will have to pay attention to what's there. Um, but if you just generally speaking have rocky soil or clayey soil, which is a bit more common, um, there are some things that you can do. And so um, Kelly Grummins, if you've heard of him, he's um, just sort of a horticulture guru in Colorado. Um, he has this sort of recipe. So if you have a, a mostly clayey soil, like 70%, um, you can incorporate in 10% wood-based compost and 20% small aggregate or crusher fines. And you incorporate that really well into your soil and it's gonna make a much nicer, um, uh, more, more inviting soil for your plants to live in. Um, if your soils are really, really compacted, either just from general, you know, people walking on the yard a lot or construction, you want to loosen it pretty deeply, at least like one to two feet and really kind of amend it nicely. Um, if your soil is really gravelly or sandy, or if it was scraped off um, because it's a new development, adding organic matter can improve um, the overall tilth, we call it, or the nutrient holding capacity. So you may need to do some soil amending depending on what you have. But again, with native plants, they tend to be able to handle our native soils better than introduced. So um, when you're kind of planning things out and you're looking at your yard, um, thinking about irrigation and water is important. And a concept called hydrozoning can be really um, very useful, very helpful. Uh, the idea behind uh, hydrozoning is that it's irrigation done by area rather than by plant. So you're going to group plants that have similar water needs together. Um, oftentimes what happens is people, you know, they see like a color combination or or a height combination that they really like. And they think, oh, I'm just going to plant these together because they look good. But if one is fairly xeric, it doesn't need a lot of water, and one is a more is a higher water need plant, and you put them right next to each other, then one or the other or both of them are not going to get the right amount of water that they need to really thrive. So if you think about your plants, you think about color combination and height and sunshade and water needs, and you group them together appropriately, all the plants are going to be getting the water that they need and you're going to be using less water generally. So it's going to be more efficient, again, using less water. Um, and I should point out, you know, if you have plants that are, they, they really take a lot of water, but you absolutely love them for whatever reason, then by all means, you should still keep those and baby them and give them what they need. But you also have an opportunity to start kind of pulling back and, and incorporating more natives and more xeric plants into your landscape. Next, uh, you want to think about microclimates. So these are just sort of like broad general things to be keeping in mind. And now we're going to get into more of the plants. Um, so microclimates, when you're designing a garden or designing a yard, you can really play a lot with uh, microclimates. And a microclimate is basically an area within your yard that has a slightly different climate than the larger area. And so um, your house creates microclimates. So if you think about um, the east side of your house is going to have nice, gentle morning sun, whereas the west side of your house is going to have that really harsh, hot, blazing western sun in the afternoon, two very different microclimates. So taking that microclimates into consideration, you can choose your plant palette based on what those conditions are. You can also create microclimate or, or plants will create different microclimates for each other. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And you can do this with berms or rock walls, whatever structures you might have. 
So just, again, it's another thing to kind of think about when you're thinking about your whole landscape. Now, it's really important to know that if you're new to gardening with native plants, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they can be incorporated into an existing landscape. It is not an all or nothing situation. Um, sometimes I think people get a little bit intimidated and they think, oh, I don't have a single native plant. What do I do? How do I start? Um, you know, as things die off, as things need to be replaced, you can perhaps choose a native plant in, in whatever you're replacing. Um, or if you're redoing a whole area of your yard, that's where you can choose native plants. How to use them. Another thing that comes up is people think, oh, I like the idea of native plants. I want to support pollinators and get more biodiversity, but they're really messy. Like I don't want my yard to look wild or my HOA has rules and things have to be really neat and tidy. So um, you can do that with native plants. They're just plants, right? So they might have a different look than something um, that's more traditionally considered a, a landscape plant that's an exotic, but they're still just plants and it's all in how you design with them and how you treat them. So um, essentially in our yards, in our landscapes, we're creating an abstraction of nature and that can be naturalistic and kind of wild or it can be very formal. Um, these photos here are all from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, uh, which is a botanic garden in Austin, Texas. I used to work there as a horticulturist there, and they um, use nothing but native plants. So they're really celebrating the native plants of Texas. And so all of these pictures, um, these are from what are called the homeowner inspiration gardens. And they're meant to show that, for example, the picture on the bottom left um, is kind of, you know, it's a little bit naturalistic. You've got the, the gravel pathways and um, looks a little more natural. On the bottom right, you've got that area of turf with sort of your perennial borders around the outside. And then the one on the top right is very formal and that's accomplished through the geometry, that strong geometry of the pathways and um, the, the hedged plants. And so you can do the same thing with Colorado Colorado plants. So it's all in how you design it and, and sort of treat it. Um, so lawn alternatives are something that people think about a lot, especially if you're kind of in the mindset of, I might want to switch over to some natives. Um, you can definitely convert your lawn to a native grass lawn. Um, you can, of course, get rid of your turf altogether and just have perennial beds and shrubs and trees. But one thing to try out or to think about and research is using um, um, buffalo grass. You can do that. Um, some people will do a blue grama buffalo grass combination mix. Um, if you do plant buffalo grass, we recommend that you order plugs and plant plugs rather than um, uh, rather than planting by seed. You can plant by seed. But then you're going to get male and female plants. And um, when you plant by plugs, you're going to get, it's going to be sterile and you're only going to get the males and that's more comfortable to walk on. So the females create these little burrs that are kind of uncomfortable to walk on. Um, it's still going to fill in and creep, but it's just a little, it's a little softer and a little more turf like. And again, this can be a pretty big job. So you can start small, just pick a small area and see how it goes. Um, like I said, you can completely get rid of your, your um, turf if you want. Um, lots of people do patios with like flagstone, that sort of thing. Some people will plant things like creeping thyme in between those pavers, but you can also use a native plant instead of something like thyme. So here we have pussy toes, Antenaria parvifolio, parvifolia. Um, it has the same sort of habit as creeping thyme. It'll fill in those little gaps and it gets cute little flowers. So um, again, you can use native plants just about any way you would use an exotic plant. All right, so if you're thinking about your planting plan, um, a lot of the um, principles that apply to general garden design also apply if you're using native plants. So you wanna think about seasonal interest, so your bloom time, um, especially if you're working to um, support pollinators then you wanna have things that bloom as early in the season as possible. 
all the way through the summer and as late into the season as possible because you're trying to support those pollinators that are there all season long. So if your garden is just blooming like crazy and really beautiful in the spring, um, you're going to attract a bunch of pollinators, a bunch of wildlife to your garden. And then if none of your plants bloom for, you know, all of July and August, and then it starts back up in September, you've essentially drawn all of these pollinators in and then sort of pulled the rug out from under them. And suddenly they have no resources and they have to go somewhere else. So you want things to bloom as long in the season as possible. Um, and then uh, seasonal interest also just in how it looks all year. So uh, I'm a strong believer that our gardens can be beautiful all year round. Um, there's sort of the idea of in the fall, we put our gardens to bed and then in the spring it wakes up again. But you can see um, these gardens here, if we go clockwise, top left is spring, summer, and then we've got fall. Well, it doesn't quite go clockwise, actually. Um, go over to the bottom left is fall, and then over to the bottom right is winter. And a lot of our native grasses and shrubs look really beautiful um, when, when it's snowy out and um, in the colder months. So you don't need to cut everything back and, and clean it up entirely. Another thing is that a lot of our invertebrates um, need that plant material to overwinter. A lot of them overwinter in leaf litter and grass, um, dormant and dead grass material. So the, the more you can actually leave, the better if you're trying to support pollinators. Um, there is a book. I have a few resources that I'm going to share at the end. Um, and one of those is um, a book from the Xerces Society that I mentioned earlier called Attracting Native Pollinators, I think is the name of it. Um, and it's a great one and it's got lots of information on um, how you want, how, how to um, sort of garden and, and attract them to your space. Okay, so next you wanna think about color, you wanna think about plant texture, again, those water needs, that hydrozoning, exposure, meaning um, sun or shade, et cetera. How big are your plants going to get? Again, these are all principles that you think about in any garden design with any kind of plants that you're using. You want to make sure you pay attention to, um, to the mature plant size. Um, all too often we see, you know, maybe it's two shrubs that when they were put in the ground, they were in a little, you know, one gallon pot or something and they were small. And the person didn't look and see that they were going to have a five foot spread when they were mature. And then the shrubs are growing too close together. They're crowding each other out. There's not as much air circulation. So that can cause um, diseases and things like that. So really pay attention to the mature plant size. Um, and then function. Do you want to block noise? Do you want to, um, do you want to, bring in certain sounds, like a lot of people like the sound of wind blowing through tall ornamental grasses. Maybe you want to screen, visually have a screen, like block out your neighbor's yard or something. Um, so anyway, these are all things that you think about when um, designing a garden. And then I have maintenance on there because it's important to, to um, match your commitment level towards maintenance with whatever you have in your garden. So um, sometimes we see somebody either has a professional design their yard and it's just absolutely amazing and beautiful and then they realize or, or they do it themselves and then they realize oh this is a lot of maintenance and I don't actually have the time or maybe interest in doing that much maintenance and then things get overgrown and it doesn't look as good and then they're not happy. So you want to try to match your maintenance commitment level to what you have in the garden. Again, these are all things we have to think through when designing a garden. Okay, now I'm going to get into some of the plants that lend themselves well to um, our urban environments and, and that we can grow here along the Front Range. So the first one is Gallardia aristata or blanket flower. Um, there's also Gallardia pulchella which is also called blanket flower, and it's a little more red on the petals. That one is not actually native to our area. It's native further east. It's also a great choice, but if you're really wanting to go pretty strictly native, Gallardia aristata is the one you're after. Retibida columnifera, or prairie cone flower. 
This is a great one. It gets pretty big. Um, I have one to two feet there, but I've seen them larger. They can be one to two feet tall and they can kind of get pretty wide, two feet wide. Um, again, they like sun, they can handle dry, they're going to bloom all summer. And you can get that yellow variety or some of them have kind of the, the reddish yellow. Mirabilis multiflora, Desert Four O'Clock is a great one. This is one that it does not look like it would be a native and it doesn't look like it would be very xeric because it kind of has fleshy leaves a little bit and it's covered in these purpley pink flowers that sort of look like um, petunia or calibricoa with the smaller flowers. Um, but it'll just be covered all summer long and it has a very deep taproot. And so it can handle quite dry conditions, which is awesome. Next, we've got Calero involucrata or wine cup. This one is pretty popular um, and pretty common, pretty readily available. Most of the ones that I'm sharing here are pretty readily available. Um, sometimes we have an issue with native plants where we say, go out and buy native plants and put them in your yard. And then people say, I can't find any native plants. So there are nurseries out there that, that do. Um, uh, do carry native plants. And this one is pretty readily available. So um, wine cup covered in those magenta flowers all summer long. Sporalcia coccinia or globe mallow. Sometimes it's called cowboy's delight. Um, this is a dainty little flower that is tough as nails. Um, it will grow in sidewalk cracks and dried out mud. Um, and it's going to bloom mid, it's starting to bloom now actually, but it's going to bloom later into the summer. Um, there are other Sporalcias or Globe Mallows that are a different species um, that come in different colors. Like there's a pink and a purple kind of lavender, um, but this is the straight native species and it's this lovely orange flower. Asclepia speciosa, so that's showy milkweed. Um, a lot of people are familiar with milkweed, especially if you're interested in um, the monarchs and other butterfly species. We are on, um, we, we are just on the edge of the migration of the monarch migration pattern. Um, but some people will get monarchs in their yards and they need, um, they need milkweed. So you can certainly plant them for that. Even if you don't plant them for the monarchs, other species, other pollinators use them too. I will say if you live next to anybody with a small acreage or next to an open space, um, you want to kind of manage these because they can become, even though they're native, um, they can become a little bit of a nuisance, especially to people with small acreage that might have livestock um, because the plants can be toxic to livestock. So you want to be a good neighbor and um, kind of choose plants responsibly. Goldenrod solidago, there are several species um, that are native here. This is a fantastic pollinator plant, blooms late in the summer. So it's a little trickier to find things that bloom late in the season, but goldenrod is one of the best. And you can see on that image on the bottom right, um, there's, a, I, think, I think I can, you can see my cursor. We have a beetle here, we have a fly, we have a honeybee, we've got a butterfly. So they, pollinators just love it. Penstemon secunda floris, side bells penstemon. This is a beautiful one. It's blooming a lot right now, especially on um, kind of rocky slopes, rocky hillsides. Um, you can see the picture on the bottom right there. You can see the flat irons in the background and then that penstemon. There are several penstemons in Colorado that do well uh, or that are native. Um, that's a really beautiful one. Then we've got um, gay feather or Leatris punctata. Again, there are other Leatrises. This is a native. Um, this is another late blooming one. It's really nice to get that pop of purple later in the, the season. Um, and this is a great pollinator species. Ribes arium, this is a shrub. So uh, most of what I've been covering is sort of, um, is perennials and herbaceous things. Here's a shrub, woody shrub, golden current. Um, it gets pretty big, four to five feet. Well, I have four to, I have five to four feet, whoops, <laughs> but four to five feet. This one can handle a little bit of shade, which is nice. Um, if you're ever out on a hike, you're going to notice them kind of nestled under or near like a ponderosa pine tree so they can handle a little bit of shade. 
Um, and in the springtime, they just pop with these yellow flowers that have kind of a clove scent. They're a great early bloomer. Fallujah paradoxa or Apache plume is another cool one. Um, these are blooming right now. And these are kind of fun because they get covered in these white flowers, but they'll also have seed heads at the same time. So that's kind of unusual. You know, most things they bloom and then they go to seed, but these uh, get these wispy little um, fluffy seed heads at the same time as blooming. And they have a really long bloom season. It's always good to incorporate some grasses into your design. Um, this is Budalua gracilis. This is blue grama. It's our state grass, Colorado state grass. Um, the straight species, what you might use if you're going to incorporate it into a, a lawn is pretty short. It's um, maybe 12 inches, but in on a, in a dry year, it might be more like 10 inches. But there is one uh, cultivar called Blonde Ambition that's used a lot and that's like two feet by two feet and it gets a really pretty kind of straw blonde color really popular really pretty seed heads schizocarium scoparium this is little blue stem um, this is a fantastic plant uh, there are several cultivars of this one um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the names of the cultivars and I can't think standing ovation I think is one but this one starts out really kind of a, a bluish green. Some of the cultivars are a little more purpley green, um, very upright bunch grass. And then these photos are from the fall. They'll turn, they go to seed and they turn sort of a rusty fall color, which is really nice. And then it's good to have some tree options. So on the left, we've got the Rocky Mountain Juniper, and on the right, of course, we've got the Blue Spruce. Colorado Blue Spruce is our state tree. So um, that is just a handful of plants. Um, there are many more options, of course. Um, at the end, I have, um, a, uh, um, I describe where you can find some resources on the CSU Extension um, publications page. Um, I don't know if somebody just maybe wants to link that in the comments, but um, if you go to CSU Extension and then Publications, there's a choice to choose native plants, and there are a bunch of different plant lists that you can choose from. Okay, so back to designing. So simple landscaping, a few things to keep in mind. Um, we want to plant in layers. So in nature, plants kind of grow in layers. We've got sort of structure with trees and shrubs. And then moving down, you've got perennials, grasses, and ground covers. Um, from the design perspective, you always want to plant in odd groupings. Um, that's more attractive to the eye. So threes, fives, or sevens. Once you get above seven, nobody's going to notice. Um, so, you know, you can plant however many. But if you have two of something or four of something, uh, it just sort of looks weird to the eye. So, and then again, pay attention to that bloom time. That's really important. Okay, so I'm going to now walk through a sample planting design. Um, this um, publication, the, the several partners um, put, um, created these booklets. Um, they're called Low Water Native Plants for Colorado Gardens. They're broken into five regions. There's front range and foothills, there's plains, there's mountains and above 7,500 feet, there's western slope, and there's one more. I can't remember, but um, the call, you can find these in PDF form on the Colorado Native Plant Society uh, website or the CSU Extension website has them too. Um, and within each of these, um, we, we have plant lists and then we have some sample designs and it's sort of like if y'all are familiar with Resource Central, it's kind of like a plug and play sort of thing. Um, you don't get the plants like with Resource Central, but you could take the list to a nursery, say these are the plants that I need, buy those, and then you can put them in the design. So um, I'm just going to walk you through one of the designs. So um, in the back corner, we've got Amorpha canescence. This is lead plant, great native shrub. Um, it's a legume, so it fixes nitrogen, which is good for other plants. 
Um, and it gets these really pretty purple spiked flowers. They're blooming um, right now and they'll go later too. And then the, it has bright orange pollen that is very visible. So that orange and um, orange and purple combination is really pretty. So that's kind of the anchor in the back corner. And then we've got Budalua crudipendula. So um, earlier I mentioned blue grama. This is side oats grama. So um, another really lovely native grass, um, kind of anchoring it on, on both sides there in the garden. Berlandiaria laurata. This is chocolate flower. Chocolate flower is a really fun plant. Uh, native plant. It smells like chocolate, especially when the sun is hitting it and it's had a chance to warm up a little bit. Um, I think it smells like a Hershey's milk chocolate bar. Not dark chocolate, not another brand, Hers Hershey's milk chocolate. Um, but on top of the lovely smell, it's also a really, really pretty plant, really tough, very xeric, um, and blooms all summer long. Then moving to the middle, we've got Artemisia ludoviciana. So this is prairie sage. Um, when you're thinking about garden design, it's good to have some areas that actually aren't blooming. Um, so they're sort of like filler plants. So the grasses can do that. And then something like an Artemisia can do that where it's, it's lovely, but it's just gray. Or you can also accomplish that with like rocks or boulders or other kind of breaks in the design. Um, and it kind of gives your eye a chance to rest. Um, and it looks a little more naturalistic um, rather than just having packed wall to wall blooming things. So um, prairie sage is a great one to use for that. Then we've got um, yarrow, Achillea millifolium. Um, the, in the design, it shows yellow, but really it's, it's a white flower. Yarrow, you can find yarrow in lots of different colors, but the native is white. Um, this is a plant that can handle some moisture or it can be quite dry. Um, you can see on the images there, skippers and butterflies really like yarrow. They have a nice landing pad for them. Then in the middle, we kind of drop down and have a shorter plant. This is Areogonum umbellatum or sulfur flower. Um, it's blooming right now. It gets covered in these really pretty um, bright yellow flowers and it has that mounding foliage uh, that's sort of grayish green. In the, um, in the fall, it turns a deep kind of burgundy red and it stays all winter. So again, thinking about interest all year round, this is a great one for that. Thalia purpurea, this is prairie, uh, purple prairie clover. Um, again, blooms kind of later summer into fall. Really pretty, really delicate flower with these nodding um, flower heads. Purple pollinators love them. Then we've got the pussy toes. I mentioned these in the flagstone patios. Um, it's a ground cover, creeping ground cover. It gets those cute little pinky white flowers. Um, can handle really dry, can be sun or part shade, which is nice. Blue flax is another one that's also blooming now and it'll bloom for a little while still. It gets those delicate periwinkle kind of flowers. Um, when the petals drop, they kind of sprinkle all over the ground, which is really pretty too. Um, so blue flax is a great one. Onothra um, caspit caspitosa. This is tufted evening primrose. Um, so we have a few different primroses native here. Um, this one is kind of pinky white. Again, blooms in the summertime, kind of a lower, it's not a ground cover, but it's a lower plant. Likes full sun, can handle really dry conditions. This is one of those that is great because it can handle really dry, but it's got this big showy flower. Sometimes things that are really xeric they don't have, they're, they're not going to expend quite as much energy on their flowers because um, they're trying to conserve everything, but this has a nice big showy flower. And then Penstem environs. So I mentioned another Penstemon earlier. This is Blue Mist Penstemon. Um, really pretty kind of bluish lavender color. Um, doesn't get too tall and it's blooming. It blooms early summer and it can also handle a little bit of shade if needed. So that, um, that's kind of walking through some different plant combinations that do well together. You've got a mix of 
yellows and blues and purples and then the greens and grays with the, the artemisia and the grasses. Um, when you're looking at color combinations, um, most often we look at um, uh, complementary colors. So those are colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel, like blue and yellow or red and green or, or blue and orange too. So um, that's just a quick walk through a native plant garden design. I just have a handful of pictures of, again, native plant combinations that do well together and you can kind of see what they look like. So already mentioned these sulfur flower mixed in with prairie sage. Here's Penstemon strictus, so the purple, and then Hymenoxus hoopsii, that sneezeweed, the yellow, tall yellow. And then in the background, we've got a white fir and a bristle, uh, bristle cone fir. And then Rebecca herda, that's um, black-eyed Susan or brown-eyed Susan. And then a penstemon. So again, that blue and yellow. A lot of Colorado native plants are blues and yellows. You, you get some reds and some oranges, but we have lots of blues, purples, and yellows. This one is showing... Um, some grass incorporated in. So in the forefront there is Indian rice grass um, and it gets a, the sun is shining really brightly on that so it's a little hard to see but um, it's a nice bunch grass and then it gets these really pretty delicate seed heads. Um, and then in the middle it's got a, a different primrose. This is evening primrose that's, that's yellow. That other one I showed was white. And then in the background is desert four o'clock. So again covered in those pink kind of pinky purple flowers and then a couple of different grasses in the back you've got little blue stem in the front blue grama i already mentioned those but i think this is a good illustration of how um, different and versatile grasses can be they all have different seed heads and um, kind of different colors so you know some people think oh ornamental grasses it's just sort of grass is grass but there's a lot of variety with our ornamental grasses. And um, I think they're a great thing to incorporate. And then Retibida, the prairie coneflower I mentioned earlier and um, Artemisia frigida. So this is a different Artemisia. Um, this is, um, it has a more fine, um, finely cut leaf. Um, but again, it's that sort of nice soft gray color. And then final plant combination, we've got Gallardia aristata over um, back here, that nice orangey yellow. And then we've got, again, that Mirabilis multiflora, the desert four o'clock. And then we've got um, blue flax hiding in here. This one I haven't mentioned yet. I don't have it listed, but that's Tradescantia um, spiderwort. It gets a nice delicate purpley blue flower. Um, and then you can see some grasses um, mixed in there as well. So um, hopefully this is getting the creative juices going and you're getting some ideas of how to kind of pair plants, group them together. Um, now I'm just briefly going to touch on finishing touches. So mulch is really important. Um, there are lots of different kinds of mulch. For native plants, generally you're going to use um, either what we call organic mulch, which is bark or wood chips or inorganic like pea gravel um, or squeegee or that sort of thing. Um, so the way to decide, so mulch does a lot of things. It will certainly help suppress weeds. Um, doesn't keep them out completely, but it helps suppress weeds. Um, it holds uh, moisture in the soil and um, it also uh, can keep the soil cooler. It, so the plant is going to dry out less. So it, not only does it hold moisture in, but it, it also just keeps it cooler. So it's a it's a more um, it's a more comfortable environment for the plants to grow. Um, when choosing like bark or wood chips versus pea gravel or something, um, it kind of depends on the plants. So if you have plants that are really really xeric, really like to be dry, you're probably going to want to go for um, a gravel mulch more like this because water is going to um, infiltrate and sort of seep through the rock mulch better than where the um, 
bark or wood chips are going to sort of hold moisture. And if you hold moisture right at the crown of a plant that likes to be really, really dry, it can start to rot out. So either don't have that mulch right up next to the plant, kind of pull it back just a little bit, or you can use a mulch more like this. So you can base it on the plants, what they kind of need or want, um, or you can base it on aesthetics too. What's more attractive to you? What kind of goes with your theme that you're after and you like? Um, but mulch is super important. Always use mulch where you can. Um, okay, so kind of wrapping things up here, I just want to introduce a concept called genius loci. Um, this is something that is taught to landscape designers and landscape architects, and it's, it translates loosely to spirit of place. So it's a location's distinctive atmosphere. And when we are incorporating native plants into our gardens, this is what we're doing. We're celebrating the spirit of place. We're celebrating all the beauty that Colorado has to offer. Um, there are thousands of beautiful plants that we can grow here. But um, there's something also really beautiful about celebrating where we are and, and what we have here in this place. Um, and again, earlier I referenced Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. She had a quote um, that I just really like, and it was, wherever I go in America, I like it when the land speaks its own language in its own regional accent. Texas should look like Texas, and I'll say Colorado should look like Colorado. So um, that is definitely one of the things that we're accomplishing when we're using Colorado native plants or, or wherever you might be, but native plants, you're supporting the biodiversity, you're supporting the wildlife that's here and the pollinators that are here. So lots of really great advantages to, um, to using native plants. Um, like I said, I have a few books that I wanted to mention. Um, I think the links have been put in the chat, so, or the comments, uh, so go ahead and look at those, but um, if you haven't heard of Doug Tallamy, um, you should definitely look him up. He wrote a book, um, gosh, I don't know, it's probably, it's over 10 years ago now, called Bringing Nature Home, um, and this was a really, this hit home for a lot of people, and he talks about um, why it's important to support local and native flora and fauna. Um, and it's a really well-written book. It's a really easy and good read and lots of really great ideas there. He's written other books since. Another, uh, another one is called Nature's Best Hope. So that's a great one to read, especially if you're interested in um, kind of learning more about why we wanna be planting native plants. Um, I included a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold just because um, this is all about the land ethic and how we interact with the land around us and how we sort of treat the land and celebrate the land. Is it ours or are we, you know, um, living and working it sort of in, um, uh, in sort of a symbiotic way, you know, so just how we appreciate the land. Um, I mentioned attracting native pollinators from the Xerces Society. Again, that's full of um, lots of good information on how to attract native pollinators, what you can do in your garden. And then The Forgotten Pollinators uh, is an interesting book. And that one by Stephen Buckman and Gary Paul Nabhan, um, that is really all about, you know, we have these very charismatic, we've got the bumblebee and the honeybee and the monarch. Um, <clears throat> but there are many, many, many other pollinators. Um, and this book, I think, was written in the mid-90s. I feel like it was 94 five or 96 maybe, um, but also really interesting. And it just gives you a whole different perspective on um, these places and spaces that we share with all of these pollinators and all these different invertebrates that we might not even realize we're supporting um, even in our urban gardens. And then, um, Finally, I've got those CSU Extension publications. So again, if you were to Google CSU Extension, um, somewhere across the top, there's something called publications that you'll look at. And then you scroll down and we have everything from irrigation to livestock to, you know, Extension covers a lot of things, but we have a section on native plants. Um, and if you click on that, you'll see this list. And so you've got native grasses, you can see all those native um, plant gardening guides with the sample designs. Um, 
their sources of native plants. So some of the different nurseries that carry them and things like that. So again, if you're sort of gathering resources and, and trying to find more information and more plant lists, that's another good, another good spot to, to go. And then I'm just going to do a quick plug again. If you are really getting interested in gardening with native plants, there's a conference um, every February called the Landscaping with Colorado Native Plants Conference. Um, I'm on that planning committee and um, this is going to be our eighth annual. So it's Saturday, February 25th, 2023. Um, with COVID, we in 2020, it was in February. And then everything shut down in March. So we snuck that one in. And then we did um, 2021 and 2022 were virtual. We're doing it virtually again for 2023. Then we're hoping to be back in person. Um, but it's great. We have uh, two different tracks, uh, a new to natives with some of the more kind of basic entry level information and then knows the natives um, for people that kind of want to sink their teeth in a little bit more and maybe already have some uh some knowledge and some experience with native plants so just wanted to put that on everybody's radar um the tickets to you know we're in the planning stages right now um registration usually goes live in december so you can just keep your keep your eyes and ears open for that if that is of interest so with that um the formal presentation is done and i can take any questions that people might have Thank you so much, Darren. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I learned so much. Um, I was just putting in a native plant garden at home, and I actually used that um, handout that you had shown with that that design as kind oh, of ins great. inspiration. And it was it was so funny. Like I'm, I want to leave space for questions, but the groupings that you mentioned in there were like so mm -hmm. cru crucial in how we had planned our garden. And like so, my husband kept being like we have to have clumps yeah, <laughs> put nice. the flowers together that's gonna yeah. be really nice <laughs> so, good. Good. Um, that's so yeah so so i think we've got a good number of those those links in the chat and uh -huh. um we've got one question right now that i'll pop up on the screen Catherine wants to know if it's too late to plant it is not too late to plant um this spring has been kind of funny. It was sort of like, it took a while for spring to hit and then it got really hot and now it's cold again or, you know, chilly and rainy again. Um, it's not too late to plant. Um, you know, we definitely say there are optimal times to plant, whether you're planting trees or shrubs or seeds. Um, but with perennials and shrubs and trees, you can pretty much plant you can pretty much plant anytime, even in the heat of the summer, as long as you're providing enough water. But ideally, if you get most of your planting done, like in June um, or by the end of June, you're going to be okay. Um, if we just hit a really hot, dry spell, then you're just going to need to put more water down. So you just sort of need to, you know, adjust your practices based on what weather we get. So like people, I would say that people that planted like last week or two weeks ago, now we're getting this cool wet weather. That's ideal, you know, um, but there was no guarantee that we were going to get this cool wet weather. So, you know, you never know. So it's not too late. That was a long way to say it's not too late. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was great. Um, I don't have everything in the ground yet either. So that's nice mm -hmm. to hear. Um, okay, let's see. Another question. What native plants can be started outside from seeds? And when do you recommend starting them? Like, do you need like stratification? All, you know, what should we do? Yeah. So um, some plants, uh, she mentioned stratification um, or scarification. So some seeds really have to either have a period of cold and then warm back up, or some actually need to be kind of nicked. Scarification, they have to be kind of, you know, people will actually like scratch them or nick them. Um, so, you know, I, I, there are some that come to mind, but like, you know, not going to go through the list of, oh, you must scarify and stratify. Um, generally speaking, um, like your, your general wildflower mix, like blue flax or the Gallardia aristata, um, 
or the grasses even, a lot of them you can, um, you could toss out in the spring and they'll probably germinate. Um, late fall is a really, or sort of late summer, early fall is a great time to put down seeds because then they're going to be in the seed bank. You want to make sure you get really good seed to soil contact. They're going to go through the winter and then they're going to be ready to, you know, hit it as soon as they start to get snow melts, temperatures warm up, the soil starts to warm up. Um, that's something that people don't realize is that the soil temperature has to get to has to get high enough for seeds to kind of wake up and, and be ready to germinate. Um, but then if we get those spring rains, then those seeds are ready to kind of take hold and really bloom uh, or, or really um, start to grow. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You can seed stuff now, you can seed stuff through the summer, um, but there are kind of ideal windows. So earlier spring or late summer and fall. Okay, thank you. Um, I just put in the chat, we're going to do a in person workshop with Darren on August 27th um, on saving seeds from native plants. That will be at the library garden. Um, so you can register for that about a month before it happens. Yeah, that'll be a fun one. Hopefully, people can join. That will yeah. be a sort of hands on thing. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, okay, let's see. I think we have time for just one more question. Let me see if there's. One more, let's see. Okay, so here's here's the question. Um, okay, just someone said thank you. Someone said thank you very much. Very mm -hmm. well done. Um, how about your thoughts on weed barrier fabric? When you're, if someone's putting in a new garden, they're ripping up their grass, what are, what are your thoughts on weed barrier fabric? So, my thoughts and generally speaking what best management practices are now is to not use weed barrier um it was the common practice for years and years and years people you can still buy it people still use it um but it really tends to be more trouble than it's worth um it's always kind of flipping up at the edges and people are you know putting rocks or mulch or trying to tuck it in and it really doesn't do what we hope it would do. It will keep weeds down for a while. It definitely will for a while. Um, but um, it can also get kind of clogged up with dust and dirt and not allow water to infiltrate. So you're sort of creating, it's a weed barrier, but it can also be a moisture barrier. Um, and a good layer of mulch is gonna be just as effective. Um, you know, I, I've heard people say, oh, well, but it's, you know, so when dust and dirt start to blow in over the years, um, weeds will grow on top of the weed barrier fabric. Um, and people say, well, it's a lot easier to pull the weeds if there's weed barrier there because um, the weed, because the roots can't get down in there. So, okay, that's true. Um, but that's not enough of an argument because there are more negatives than there are positives. So it can stop water from infiltrating in. It's, you know, it's a pain to, to get it installed and to keep it covered. So best management practices now are to not use weed barrier. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. And I'll just quickly follow up. If you already have it in there, that's okay. But you can like slowly but surely start to take it up and start to remove it as you're redoing areas. Yes. It's such, such a pain when it has started to disintegrate and it's like such stuck a pain. in the ground. Yep. You know, yep. It gets all fibrous. Yep. All right. Well, I think we are just about out of time. Um, I think I see one more thing. Great. Yeah. So I think we can kind of wrap up. Um, thank you so much. Darren, this was wonderful. Um, I am really looking forward to the, the Native Plant Seed Saving Program. Um, for those that are watching, if you don't know, the Maine Library just last year installed a Native Plant Demonstration Garden in one of our courtyards. That's where we'll be holding the seed saving workshop at the end of August. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise tonight, Darren. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, the Boulder Library Foundation, which funds the vast majority of the programs at the library, including the one this evening. So check them out. We've got their, their link in the comments. And then I want to thank my coworker, Julian, who's been behind the scenes helping with the engineering of the broadcast and the, the chat. So thanks, Julian. And with that, we will 
close and hope that all of you watching feel inspired to go out and, and plant some, some native plants in your home gardens and have a new sense of appreciation of them. So thanks, Darren, and we'll, we'll call it a night. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. Bye, everybody.